In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place. I'm Eric Barnes with The Daily Memphian, and welcome to this edition of the Extra Podcast. Today we're talking to Jeff Calkins, columnist for The Daily Memphian and host of his own show on 92.9. Uh, thanks for joining us, Jeff. Oh, it's good to join you. Um... I wanted to, this is a weird way to start this, but I wanted to talk a bit about the notion of covering such a controversial issue. And I, and it came on my mind for, I'm going to say this almost as a joke, but it was actually really kind of startling. A friend of mine, maybe I think actually a friend of yours as well. I was talking to her and she said, does Jeff get death threats right now based on what he's writing and the, and the kind of social media reaction and some among some people and comments and so on. You can ask, you can respond on whether you get death threats, but it, it made me think it's worth kind of talking about just the vitriol that this issue raises and that people who do opinion like you are receiving. Oh, well, the short answer is I've gotten in my career as a journalist in Memphis, one, I think, death threat. And it was, I was at the Mike Tyson fight and, and someone who I'd written about walked over and dropped something on my laptop and it was their permit to carry. And my photo was laminated on the back of it. They had taken my photo out and laminated it on the back of their permit to carry. And I think that's at very least an intimidation, but had nothing to do with COVID. Now, what I get is what's been tricky for me is, you know, I am at heart a sports columnist. I write about other things too. And I talk about other things too. Um, and it's hard enough to be an expert on everything when it comes to sports, whether it's, you know, the Grizzlies and the Tigers and the Tiger basketball team, Tiger football, like everything. But then you throw in uh, the issues that we're dealing with today that are roiling society, a pandemic and a social movement. Um, and you and, and you try to write and talk intelligently about those as well. Mostly what I get is stick to sports. That's what people say. Yeah. They stick to sports. What do you know? And, um, and it's why I don't really, when it comes to covering uh, either the pandemic or the Black Lives Matter movement, both of which I have done over these past few months, more of the pandemic than the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, I tend to rely on other people, really, you know, like, um, you know, I, I, I write about epidemiologists or I write about a woman who had COVID and everywhere she went before she knew she had COVID. And um, or I write about how Kirk Whalem is dealing with the pandemic and a musician, who, a touring musician who can't tour. Um, and so, yeah, there's there's certainly some backlash, particularly on Twitter, mostly is where it would be. But mostly it's from the stick to sports crowd. And what you really realize is that they don't want you to stick to sports if you're tweeting out a picture of your puppy or a cheeseburger or something else. Exactly. They don't right. care. They, they just don't. don't want to hear you say that COVID is an actual thing that we have to take seriously. And, um, and then they tell you to stick to sports. You've been writing in Memphis. Is this 26 years now? It's 25 or 26. It's 96. Now. So it's 24, yeah. 20, 24, 25 years. Yeah. Okay. And where does this rank in terms of controversial sto- sports related stories? It's got to be way up there. You know, I actually, oh yeah. I mean, the, the other things were so much smaller, like um, whether the Grizzlies should come or not is a pretty modest little issue. Now it's not, it was $250 million sort of um, debate. And it was about, really the conscience of a community too. Like the people who were arguing don't build FedEx forum and David Waters was one of them was saying, you know, it's just, this is immoral to having just built the pyramid to go build a $250 million palace to an NBA team. And so that was really controversial. And I was more, I mean, I was really in the, the thick of that one in a way that this one I write about more at the periphery. I do wonder though, we talk about how controversial it is. Don't we, I, I, don't you think that the, the, the level of discord in the country, I don't think it could be overemphasized how much discord there is in the country, but yeah. don't you think most of us fundamentally 
think COVID is real, think it's that we've not done a good job of handling it, thinks that it's good to wear masks, thinks, don't you think it's 80% of America thinks, and, and then there's gradations about whether you should wear a mask right. outside or whether schools should be open right. or whatever. I wonder if there's as much discord over COVID as, 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 as it sometimes can seem on Twitter. I, I don't know. You know, I kind of I think I'm in your boat. I'm always sort of this naive optimist about issues like this. Yeah. And then I go and look at the comments on one of your on our site um, on, in, on our site on one of your columns. And I go, oh, well, OK, apparently, right. you know, but it, it, there's so much. It's one of those issues around which there's so much vehemence that I think that the opposition to things like masks and the doubters get a lot more attention then their percentages probably show because it's they're so loud and so angry about yeah. it. I suspect the columns that you're referring to, and again, I really don't, I've learned not to read the comments. So oh, that was gonna be one of my questions. Yeah, if you I, did, don't, I don't read, it. the only read of time I read the comments is when I think people are gonna be saying nice things. And so then <laughs> I'll read them. But like, when I do a, that too, I do the, that. The, the column about that, um, that the column about Collierville and football or the most recent column about Memphis high school football. Yeah. I don't read the comments to that a, because I don't need the vitriol, but B because some of the responses are depressingly stupid. Um, the, the level of, of just disconnect to reality. Um, so for both of those reasons, I don't now on those ones, I weigh in hammer and tong cause those really are sports issues. I think the idea that we're playing high school football is just insane. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just insanity. Like if you want to argue about whether high school should be in session or how we do it or whether it should be, you know, a, 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 some sort of a hybrid model or whatever else, I think that's whether Shelby County schools should be in session. But I don't see how you can morally say we should be playing high school football when we don't have high school. I mean, that just seems crazy to me. And then when we've seen what's happened in Cairoville and Lausanne and other places because of football, I think the whole idea of playing high school football in a pandemic is just insanity. And so I don't have any problems weighing in heavily on that one. Yeah. You had a great line in, I, I, I wrote it down or I copied it because I think part of what, what's interesting, you know, it's back to the thing people are happy with the puppy dogs. Um, you know, that you can have your opinions about puppies, but not about, you know, some kind of politicized issue like COVID has, has become. Um, but I mean, if you step back from it, and I'm not just saying this to be nice to you, partly what like that column, you just partly, yeah, you had your opinion that high school sports shouldn't be happening, but you also gave, you, you, you there's a kid here, Kaleeb Almo from Kirby High who can't play football. And he says, you know, this is the chance for a lot of players to get a scholarship. For kids in this city, there are a lot of things more dangerous than COVID-19. Why does everybody else get to play when we don't? Because the, the suburban schools are playing, the private schools are playing. How come we're sitting on the sidelines when other kids are having fun and scoring touchdowns? And it just broke my heart to hear this kid who is 18, 17, 19 years old, right? You know, just so upset and kind of powerless in the situation and the issues of equity and, you know, the school that is the school system that's 90% African American and the school systems that are more dominant white are playing and the African American. I mean, all that sort of captured there. Um, that to me is not so much like, I, I, I'm surprised the vitriol that creates because people want you to take that and then conclude that he should be playing. But instead you do this job of sort of like, this is not a simple thing. This is a very complicated, painful decision. Um, your conclusion you might say is you know, simple, they shouldn't be playing, but you give fair airing to the other side of it in a way. And oh, well, I don't know. I, it's, the individual it's, frustration of those kids is, is, I don't know how you couldn't, be moved by it. Now, the truth of the matter is, why do we care more about those kids than kids who are missing out on theater or debate or anything mm -hmm. else? It shows a little yeah. bit of our craziness over football. But um, I don't see, yeah, I, that's moving to me. And of course, to me, the answer is, is um, the reason that you're playing and the other folks aren't isn't that you should be playing. It's that the other folks are literally flouting the recommendations of the health department. I mean, literally, they're basically saying, we don't care about the sacrifices that other people are making, including you. We're playing, even though the health department says, for our community, this is a bad thing to do. 
And that is the level of entitlement that I think is being shown by the high schools that are continuing to play. It also does, though. They can social distance more effectively. They do have more resources. They do have more testing. And so we get into that, you know, general giant problem of disparity in America, um, yeah. and um, which is, shapes a lot of it as well. It's also an interesting thing to me. Well, one, it's, I'm always struck by, I mean, I do sometimes read the comments. I go in and out of reading the comments. Um, I do get emails from people who are mad that you or whoever, I don't get a ton of them, but right. you know, that they're mad because X, Y, Z expressed an opinion. And it's like you said, just stick with sports. And it, it is this amazing thing. Like you're expressing your opinion all the time. <laughs> like, and, right. and this just so angers them, you know, when you express an opinion of a magical night, when the Grizzlies win, that's an opinion. That's not objective. You know, I mean, it was a magical night, by the way, I was probably at that right. game, but. I don't know. It just, it, it, people want this thing from news that, um, and we live in such a polarized country and cable TV is filled with pundits, not reporters. And I, I just find it fascinating how people are reacting. Chris Harrington's getting the same thing because he's doing a lot of opinion right now. And, it, and then, and then, and then sounds- the other thing that people want is they want this, their sports world to be totally free of any of this. Right. And, and, I would maintain, you know, I've gotten a lot of um, sports is supposed to bring us together and instead it's splintering us and blah, blah, blah. And, and I honestly think that's a fantasy. I think they're imagining a world of sports that has never existed, whether it was the idea that sports quote unquote brought us together when Jackie Robinson integrated, it was uh, integrated baseball. No, it, there were those people who didn't want progress, who were just, who were furious in the same way that there are people right now who are furious over the black lives matter protest. Uh, you know, messaging by the NBA players. So it, they have already always been entwined and people think that, you know, I, I, I don't even know how you would quote unquote stick to sports now because it has never been more, you know, uh, clear that sports is not a distinct part of society, but is wrapped up in all the other challenges and, and issues of society broadly. I mean, you think back on, just, just think back on Muhammad Ali. Right. And, like for people, we're out two old guys talking about our childhood, but I mean, Muhammad Ali was such a bigger than life, incredible figure. I mean, take LeBron, I mean, in pre-internet, pre-cable and all that, it's just hard to describe to people how big a deal Muhammad Ali was, I think, when, he, when right. I was a kid. And he's now kind of on, you know, he's in the Apple ads and he's kind of found this other, you know, he's, he's come back and he's just sort of beloved, I guess. They banned him from his sport. Right. You know, I mean, they explicitly, I mean, obviously Colin Kaepernick was sort of implicitly right. banned and all that. Mom, they proudly banned him and stripped his title. And he, the things that were done in sports and sports as a way to express protest, the 68, isn't the 68 Olympics? 68 Olympics, the, the, Olympics yeah. the, the track team, you know, did the black power thing. Um, it, is, it is fascinating to me that people are like, stick to sports, sport, just be athletes. I mean, it doesn't work that way. I, I, right. Whether and, or not I agree with them, it just yeah, and I mean, and li- li- you know, we also start we start with a national anthem at every sporting event. So we right from the from the up from that red get go, we aren't sticking to sports. So, um, uh, you know, in terms of honestly, professionally, it has been a really kind of interesting time and gratifying time because um, you know I've been doing this for twenty five years, and there's only so much you can write about a Memphis football game, and um, and so. To be writing about these real things um, in a way has been, um, you know, and I think the Daily Memphian, broadly speaking, I mean, we saw how the readership went up and everything else during this, it, it, yeah. you begin to realize what a public resource it is. And, um, and so from that perspective, it's been good. One thing I think uh, must confuse people, um, you wrote in the midst of this, of, of some pretty you know critical columns about the handling of this, you wrote a really lovely column about the first um, U of M game. And you called it, you know, sort of this, this lovely strange, and you captured the strangeness and you, and I think people, again, it's back to that sort of political politicalization or the, the partisan, people want you to be anti all football or right. pro all football. Oh, no, they, they, they don't want they that want new one. They don't want you to yeah. go celebrate this, this magical night that maybe should or shouldn't have happened and happened imperfectly, but let's go ahead and celebrate for what it is. And that just makes people's brain explode because you're supposed to be on one side or the other. 
I think it's easier for people if they can make you seem irrational or an extremist, right? And I'm not even, let's be honest, if you're going to be on one extreme or the other here, it's very clear to me the I'm not leaving my basement until 2022 is the right extreme to be on rather than the I insist on wearing my no mask and or, you know, at Kroger. So, um, so, but they want to, you know, I forgot what happened recently. Some, something happened recently that was good, and and people will t- will tweet me and say that must really break your heart that that's happening. And no, I'm actually not a stay in the basement guy. I covered the first 901 FC game match that was at AutoZone Park. Well, Dr. John McCullers was there, sitting in the audience too. They they did it. Epidemiologist, expert from UT and Labonner, yeah. and just a brilliant guy. He 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 was asked to smash the guitar, or whatever. But but the point is. I actually do think we have to get on with our lives. The question is, what part of our lives do we prioritize? How do we do it, et cetera? And so at the University of Memphis, where um, everyone was 12 feet apart, everyone was wearing masks, it was outside. I actually had no, I I thought it was a sign. It was a little bittersweet that more people couldn't be there. And I thought the complaints that more people weren't there were irrational, but I support that. I think we do have to, as best we can, um, choosing judiciously, um, get on with our lives. But getting on with our lives doesn't mean like Tennessee is going to do this weekend, putting 20, 25,000 people in a stadium. That seems to me to be crazy in a pandemic. Right. Uh, let me take a quick second and remind everyone that the Extra Podcast is one of many weekly podcasts we do at the Daily Memphis, including the Behind the Headlines podcast, as well as shows on politics, sports, food, and more. All of our podcasts are on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, on the Daily Memphian site, or wherever you get your podcasts. And a quick note that this show, as well as Jennifer Biggs' food podcast, will soon be somewhat shifted and rebooted and will be broadcast on WYXR. It will start hopefully in October, we think, early October. Um, WYXR, formerly WUMR, the jazz station, uh, is now a partnership between Crosstown, the University of Memphis, and us at the Daily Memphian. So 91.7, be looking for that. Um, the, um, what else? I mean, um, Black Lives Matter and the protests and, um, how have you approached that? You talked about, I mean, it was strange that it all kind of came in the middle of COVID, um, how much pushback have you gotten on that at all? On I really, it's funny. I mean, on that one, I haven't written much about it. I did, yeah. I did go, um, cover one night of the protests early on. Um, I went and got a, I mean, honestly, a wonderfully moving night. They were, uh, the protests. Oh, yes, yes. uh, Outside of the temple, they were singing Amazing Grace. I think, I don't know that I've ever tweeted a video that got more, you know, retweets than that. It was just beautiful. There was a certain element of self-congratulation on the part of Memphis that look at us, we're this look, this is how the protests are going here, which I thought was sort of misplaced. I, you know, whatever. I not that not that um, you know, there there were one wonderful things about the way the protests unfolded in Memphis, but I haven't gotten it there is some of that. Um, but honestly, like I'm on the session at Idlewild Presbyterian Church, and um they put up a Black Lives Matter banner there. And what you see from all over the place is folks conflating those three words and the broader movement, Black Lives Matter, which seems to be pretty self-evident, hardly even controversial. Like the, 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 the Black Lives Matter, that's a, fair, that's a fairly non-controversial thing to ask. Um, and there's a lot of what I think is intentional conflating of that with the Black Lives Matter organization. It's the same thing that the people who want to, you to make you seem irrational in the or an extremist on the on the in the when it comes to COVID intentionally conflate the broader movement with the organization. And so I get a lot of that. Do you really want to uh, support an organization that believes blah, blah, blah? But um, I haven't been, you know, deeply involved in that. And um, partly because I, I really do think it's incumbent mostly on me to to uh, to shut up and listen. I don't know that I'm one who should hold himself as an expert on that. Yeah. Did you get much pushback? And again, you, you're hosting a radio, a sports radio station, sports radio program five days a week. When the NBA started and there was, you know, the NBA 
fully embraced, you know, the, the notion of this protest and this, this call for equality and Black Lives Matter with the names on the jerseys and so on. Did you get much pushback from readers? Well, there's some, but at this point, people know pretty much on the radio that, you know, where my, uh, <laughs> where, where my uh, sympathies lie on that. I thought yeah. one of the things that Chris Harrington was on my show, Chris, of course, writes for the Daily Memphian, and he made this point about the NBA that, because there was a lot of people who say, I'm never going to watch the NBA. NBA ratings are down because of Black Lives Matter, because of the, 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 because of the protests. And Chris made this point, which I thought was very good. In 20 years ago, he's from Arkansas, small town Arkansas, fundamentally. His family is small town Arkansas. And 20 or 30 years ago, they all watched the NBA. Now they don't really. And it's, 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 they sort of look at the sport. It's become, it seems, you know, sort of urban, cosmopolitan, modern, internet, you know, there's a lot. And they just sort of say, this sport is not for me in a way that college football still speaks to them. Right. And so obviously there's all kinds of racial overtones to that as well, but it's less explicitly because I don't believe many people are turning off the NBA because it says Black Lives Matter on the court. I hope not, right? But I do believe that there are people who have concluded in the last 15 years that this sport is, you know, is not for me. And, um, and, and I don't know, I, I think it's more the urban rural divide there perhaps than anything else. And that is playing out and we are seeing it, but not a lot of pushback on the radio about it. There's certainly some people who want LeBron to shut up and dribble, but I, 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 not as many as you would think. Yeah, yeah. Um, what next for, I mean, this is kind of a sports question, but just, I mean it more broadly. I mean, I don't, what next for the U of M with this football season? Like, where yeah. does this go? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, one of the things that's interesting is that sports has mattered less to people, just gen, even yeah. when it gets to be played, I think it matters less. Um, and I think some of that's because it's disrupted and it does not qu- doesn't look quite like it used to look. Um, but I think some of it's just we as a society have other priorities right now, other things we're arguing about and caring about in our own lives. And so, I mean, you see it in readership at the Daily Memphi, and it used to be that the top five most read stories every day were sports stories a lot, lot of times or lots of days. And now it's and it should be stories about COVID and stories about how we're handling COVID and all these other issues. So it's been interesting as a sports writer, just because I don't hear a lot of people talking about how the Memphis Tiger basketball team is going to be, how good they're going to be this year. It's just not, yeah. whereas normally, you know, we had already last year, they'd already been to the Bahamas. They'd already, you know, we were really knee deep and as a community in the hopes and dreams of that basketball team. I just don't think it matters as much right now. The NFL has done a pretty good job of feeling like the NFL, um, but it's really hard to get your emotions tied up in Memphis Tiger football when you don't know on a given week if there is even going to be Memphis Tiger football. I don't blame them for trying to play. I don't blame Memphis Tiger basketball for trying to play. They're trying to, there are real financial implications that will impact lots of things there. How many people are employed in the future and everything else. So I don't blame them for trying to play, but I think one thing that's happened is people are just less emotionally invested. And I think the hope is that that's a temporary disconnect rather than a, you know, a permanent one. And last thing, um, you know, back to the, the quote from the, the, the young man that from Kirby high school, um, you know, was talking about trying to get a scholarship and, you know, not being able to play. Um, do you think, I mean, do you have any sense, a crystal ball on like what, what impact that does have on, I mean, our kids are about the same. They're, they're all in college. I don't think any of them are on athletic scholarships, but that whole college process is so it's, it's busted up on the academic side. I mean, it's just crazy. And then on the sports side, in terms of kids being able to get noticed and so on. I mean, is that, is that real for them? Well, the interesting thing, of course, is, is that, is that in the end, football teams will give out as many scholarships as ever, right? So in terms of actual, it may go to different kids and particular kids may not get the, 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 you know, their moment in the sun and, and, and whatnot that they would have gotten. Um, uh, And so I think that's, that might, 
might be an impact, but it, it is so dwarfed by the impact um, that that the, the lack of schooling is having on our kids. Like it, that it's that it, I almost feel silly talking about it. Like we already had the summer slide, which is basically, you know, school ends and most kids regress during the summer that now ended in March. It's, it's an avalanche now. And so it's, that's why I always, I've made no apologies for being a sports writer. I care about sports, but in the hierarchy of needs at moments like this, it feels so diminished. Like, let's get the kids back in school and stop, you know, and, and the idea that there's the protest for football or the outrage over football or whatever, relative to what everyone else is missing so much is almost a little, it, not to minimize the real pain that it's calling those football players, right. but it's almost so dwarfed by our, uh, the, giant societal impact of the lack of in-person yeah. schooling generally. Did you read, um, Jason Gay had a great, he's a sport, a sports writer. Columnist. Oh, he's hilarious. He's hilarious. hilarious. He's, yeah. so, he's just one of the best writers out there after you. Um, he's just so good. And he wrote a column about being, he's a young parent and about how he couldn't focus on anything about except where his little kids are going to go to school. You know, it's like, right. oh, a shark jumped and did a flip right in front of me. Really? Well, what are, how are they going to do lunch? You know, like all <laughs> he can, I, I'm barely capturing it, but yeah, it, it is. I mean, the, the academic stuff just dwarfs any concern about sports. And it is, I, it is interesting that that notion that, you know, yeah, theoretically, I mean, I wanted the distraction when the, when the Grizzlies started, you know, and I watched, I think, all, I think I watched all their playoff games when they were in the play in and playoff games. Play-in, I mean, yeah. it was a good distraction. It didn't help. I still felt, right. you know, there's still monotony. There's still all the uncertainty. There's still all the anxiety of living in this time about everything from kids to family to personal stuff. And so it was not a very effective elixir. It's not the Grizzlies fault. It's not that they right. lost. It doesn't have anything to do with that. It just right. didn't have the same, well, I'm getting, I am getting pleasure out of the NFL. Um, I really am. Like I'm caring about, maybe it's because my Buffalo Bills are 2-0. and o, And so I'm getting pleasure you're out of the Buffalo NFL. Fan? I didn't, wait, wait, you're a Buffalo fan? I never, I never knew. <laughs> but the, um, the uh, you know, the SEC starts this weekend. And it will be really interesting to see because sometimes when something comes back, it's wonderful and you wrap your arms around it and it's, this is great. I, and sometimes it's just a reminder of, of what is lost. Like the... Right. Florida is playing at Ole Miss this weekend. That would be a huge game. Right. People would be pouring into to Oxford. The economics, economic boom, the, the Grove would be jammed. And to see the empty Grove on that Saturday, might, it might be a very bittersweet day. And that's yeah. when things right. return, but not quite the way that they used to right. be. It can remind us of how, how sort of miserable this thing is. Yeah. Well, and again, that's that is really what you captured in that column about the the opening night of uh, uh, U of M football. Um, that is all the time we have though today. Thanks, Jeff, for joining us. I really appreciate it. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the Daily Memphian on the site for unlimited articles. Follow me on Twitter at, at Eric Barnes two or follow at Daily Memphian. Again, subscribe to this weekly podcast and our other Daily Memphian podcasts, including the Behind the Headlines podcast, as well as shows on politics, sports, food, and more. You can go to iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, the Daily Memphian site. Thanks, and join us next week. In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, the Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place.